Okay, let's go. Let's uh, let's get started here. Welcome to 2024 and uh, Happy New Year. Seven days later than I usually do these, but uh, we're getting started here. And uh, I, I actually want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for being part of the Speed Secrets community. And thanks for being part of these things. I love doing these chalk talks. I love doing a Q&A session. Um, so I'm looking forward to this. We're going to have some fun. As if you've been on these before, you know the procedure. In the chat area where everybody's uh, uh, signing and saying hello and all that kind of stuff, um, you're welcome just to plunk in a question in there. And what we're going to find, what and what we're going to do is rather than putting them into some of them into the Q and A session and then some into the chat, let's do all of our questions in the chat area. So if you have put something in the Q and A session, just stick it right into the uh, into the chat uh, box. Um, it just makes it a little easier for us to follow it all. Plus, every now and then we get some little side conversations going where. Somebody asked a question and somebody in the Speed Secrets community uh, chimes in and answers the question from their perspective as well. Uh, obviously, my goal is to get through all of your questions, which I think we should have them done by sometime tomorrow morning, I'm pretty sure. Just joking. Maybe tonight. Uh, so we're uh, I'm not putting a big time limit on this thing, but uh, I, I find that if we get to sort of beyond two hours, people start dropping off anyways uh, at the very longest. So we probably will wrap it up around that point or shorter before that or sooner sooner than that. Um, again, Q&A session, free for all. I don't have a specific topic to talk about. Uh, I'm pretty sure some of you came with a specific topic you want to talk about and ask about. So we will get into those things. In fact, I did get... Yeah, there's always a there's always a few people that go, oh, I'm going to get my question right away. So they email it to me. Um, Angus asked me a question saying, having recently added iRacing and Sim Racer Academy to my real life racing, I find it challenging to feel the back end of the car and to catch the back end once it is significantly sideways. I don't have this issue in real life in Formula Fords. Thoughts? Here's here's my thoughts about the difference between a sim racing situation and a real life situation. Uh, this is the grand, uh, 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 a huge uh, uh, stereotyping here, but I think there are two kinds of drivers in the world. Those who sense the limit of the car off the front tires and those who sense the limit of the car off the rear tires. And if somebody has come up through karting and then into cars or straight into cars, they are more likely, not always, but they are more likely to sense the limit of the car off of the rear rear car or the rear tires. And what they're really doing is they're sensing the yaw in the car. And so that's where the that's where the sensing of the limit comes from. In a sim, unless you have some multi-million dollar sim rig that has yaw action in the in the sim rig, it's harder to sense that feel. So what Drivers who have come up more using a sim, a simulator, some form, uh, they tend to sense the limit of the car more off the front end of the car, off the front tires. So they turn to the corner and then feel like, okay, the car is not, not turning as much as I want, it's, so it's understeering a little bit more. And for that reason, they go, oh, okay, now I need to react and do something. So <clears throat> Angus, if, if you know, you're coming from driving a real world Formula Ford, where you do sense more off of the yaw angle in the car. And then when you get into the sim rig, you don't have that feel. That feel has been mostly removed. I'm not gonna say it's entirely because there is a visual part of it where your visual picture changes a little bit, but that's the reason why. That's, that's the reason why some drivers who are really good on in real world cars and tracks, they get into a sim and they immediately go, this doesn't work. Uh, because I don't have that feel of that motion. So what you need to do is learn to sense the car more off the front tires. And by the way, when you do that, you will become faster in real life as well. Because now not only are you sensing it off the yaw, but you're sensing it more through the steering input as well, or the steering output. Um, remember, 
steering wheel is an input device, but it's also an output device. We get feedback through the steering wheel as well. So Angus, I'm going to say stick with it. Learn to use the feel of the front end of the car to sense the limits, and therefore that will help you become even better in real in the real world car in your Formula Ford. Um, so I see tons of questions coming in. Um, as you know from my previous chalk talks, if you've been on before, um, I have my lovely assistant, Robin. Uh, Robin is madly writing away and grabbing your questions. And so the only thing I'll say is, as they come in like really thick and heavy rate at the moment, slow down, take your time, be patient. I know you want to get your question asked quick and get out of and get out of town. Uh, but uh, remember, this whole session is being recorded. At the end of the session, you can just go into the thing and hit replay, go to the replay point, and that will um, you'll be able to watch the whole thing as well. And you can zoom along and uh, 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 find where your question was and spend more time there if you want. But what I'm saying is slow down just a little bit and that'll give us a little time to kind of get caught up here for a little bit. So we'll try to get through a bunch of these questions and then I'll move on to some of the other ones. Okay, um, one other one that I'm gonna answer right now before uh, jump into these ones is, uh, Matthew asked the question of, after eight years of driving the same car and track, I'll be driving a different one. How should I approach learning the new car? And he goes into some detail of going from a Lotus Elise to a Porsche GT4 and you know both being mid-engine cars, but Porsche is 1,000 pounds heavier, but with more 100 horsepower more, um, more tire as well. Um, so to me, learning the car is all about what we, kind of what I was just talking a little bit about is learning to sense what the car is telling you. And um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go to uh, sort of my standard thing here right now of talking about sensory input sessions, because I probably will come back to this more than once throughout this chalk talk. Here's what I think, here's, here's my sensory input sessions. Here's, here's what you do, is you go on the track and you take a certain amount of time, a specific amount of time, and it's not two laps. You know, it could be 15 minutes, it could be 30 minutes. And all you do for a session is, all you do is you focus on everything that you can see. And the idea here is that if you, consciously focus on taking in more visual information, your brain will get better at using that information. So you go on the track and your goal is almost like, let me find five things that I've never seen before. So you don't worry about lap times, you don't worry about the line, you don't learn, worry about, well, you do worry a little bit, not worry, but you're aware of traffic around you. Um, but you really, really focus on just taking in more visual information, more visual references, more visual pictures than you've ever noticed before. So uh, you, you do that for a session. And when you come in at the end of that session, you ask yourself or you have somebody else ask you, what did you see that you've never seen before? So you do that. You do, a, do that for an entire session. And then you take another session where all you do is you focus on everything that you can hear. So you listen for the sound of the engine, the sound of the brakes, the sound of the transmission gearbox, the sound of the tires, the sound of the air rushing past the car, the sound the car makes going over different surfaces on the track. So you become hypersensitive to everything that you can feel. Do you feel the G-forces building in your body and then starting to let go? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I just jumped ahead to kinesthetic stuff. Auditory, you, you, you hear as the car is going through the corner, can you hear the different levels of grip going through that corner? So there's a question. And then at the end of the session, you ask yourself, what did you hear that you'd never heard before? And then yes, then you do a third session, which is kinesthetic or everything that you can feel. G-force is building up and then starting to relax. Uh, the feedback through the steering wheel, again, what I was just talking about, like, do you feel the steering wheel getting heavier, 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 lighter, lighter, lighter. What is that feel telling you about the limits of the, of the car and the tires? As you're going through the corner, you, you really sense those things and you feel that through the steering wheel. You feel vibrations through the pedals. You feel the, the vibrations, through, you feel the, the chassis dynamics, um, all of those things. You feel bumps in the track. Sometimes like a turn in point, a line reference could be a bump in the track. You know that 
when you're online, there's just that little bump and there's just that little bump. And if you don't feel that bump, then you know you're offline. So you do a session that is totally focused on soaking up more kinesthetic, more feel. And again, at the end of that session, you ask yourself, hey, what did I notice that I've never noticed before? And you do that. And what that does is it, you know, going from one car to the next, there's a different feel. There's a different sound. There's a different picture uh, that you get. And that's the biggest difference between cars. So if you spend that time deliberately practicing, deliberately getting better at feeling, sensing all of those things about the car, then you're going to learn that car better. So switching from one car to another, that's my first recommendation. Okay, Robin, where are we here with, uh, we only, you only have one more question to ask and then we're done. No. Uh, okay, Dan asked a, car, or a question, in a low powered momentum race car in a fast corner requires some braking, is it better to trail brake or as I've experienced, brake earlier and then go to full throttle before turn in? Dan, I'm, uh, I, I agree with you at least 90% of the time. Uh, you know, there is no rule that says you should always do that, but I'm a big fan of in fast corners. Uh, when we try to go fast in fast corners, it's kind of our natural instinct of, well, I'm going to break a little later and a little later and a little later. And then we come into the corner and especially in a fast corner for trail braking a little bit, we come in and the car is just, it's, it's not perfectly balanced. Maybe it's going to help us turn quickly, but in those fast corners, you probably don't need to change direction really quickly, abruptly. So you're better off doing any kind of speed adjustment, do it early and do it sometimes so early that as you say, you're able, you're able to get on power as you turn into the corner. I'm gonna say most likely if you look at the data, you're not quite gonna get on power right as you turn in, but that's kind of the goal. And so, yes, I'm Dan, I'm a hundred percent. And by the way, you know, you can look, you, you say in a low power momentum race car, I'm going to say this works in high powered. Uh, well, they're all momentum cars. Um, <laughs> but even if you have a lot of horsepower, a lot of power, um, I'm with you. Do your speed adjustment in fast corners earlier rather than in the corner, because that just upsets the balance of the car. You have less grip and therefore, um, therefore you just, you're not going to get through that corner as quick. So yes, Derek asks, what's a smart way to practice, uh, timing and rate of release of braking, braking while heel and toe shifting? Um, so Derek, uh, great question in the thing that I'll say though, is like heel and toe, you should be done your heel and toe by the time you, by all your downshifting, you should be finished that by the time you get to the turn-in point. And where the timing and rate of release comes in is right around that turn-in point to after that turn-in point. So they're really, uh, I'm gonna say they're kind of separate. So I would think of in terms of a smart way to practice is, you know, during a session, just make sure that you're going down through the gears and getting your downshift done. You know, my rule, and uh, I, I should state it now that all rules are meant to be broken, right? <laughs> uh, that, there are no absolute 100% rules. Maybe there's a couple. Um, I think they have to do with physics. But uh, uh, but I will say that when I say it, my rule, it's really a guideline that it works way more often than it than it doesn't work. And and in this case, getting your downshift done and completed to the point where you got you have your foot off of the clutch pedal and back over in the dead pedal area by the time you initiate your turn in the corner, that should be your goal. So you should practice that. The timing and rate of release of the brakes really starts uh, uh, mostly, mostly it happens from the turn-in point on. Now, I'm not going to say that we don't start to release just before the turn-in point at times. And yes, there are times we do that. And, you know, I've talked about this where that last little tiny bit of the brake zone, and let me, you know, let me use a, an example here of, let's say the red car is coming in, Red car is coming in, and let's say the turn in point is right there. All the downshifting has been done, and by this point right here, by this point right here, the downshifting and is completely done. Now, in this area right here, 
you know, if this is breaking, 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 breaking from about here to let's say in this corner, because it's a hairpin and we got to change direction a lot, there's going to be some trail breaking. And let's say the trail breaking happens to, to there. This is where most of the timing and rate of release of the brakes happen. However, however, I'm going to say from around here, in this area right here, there's a little bit of fine tuning of your speed and the load you want in the car. There's right in that area there, you want to be starting to think about, you know, right in here, you're thinking, do I need to stay on the brakes longer to slow down more? Or do I need to start releasing a little sooner to make up my corner entry speed high enough? So there is a little bit of that overlap there, but it's going to be very small. And that's why I'd say, you know, most of your, most of the downshifting part is completed by the time you're really focused on the timing and rate of release. Hopefully that answered that. Stuart asked, do people have a problem with too little blinking or too much blinking? Uh, Stuart, can you clarify? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Too little blinking. I'm going to leave that. And Stuart, maybe you can clarify what that is. Maybe that's a typo. I'm not sure. Max asked, and I'm pretty sure this is Max for stopping asking this question, right? Um, <laughs> uh, what is the best way to get comfortable with tight racing room when going from time trials to wheel to wheel? Yeah, it's definitely Max for stopping asking that question. Uh, getting comfortable with tight racing room. He's not very good at that, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get into any conversations about uh, who your favorite driver is. Um, Max, I'm going to say the best way. You ask what is the best way. The best way is to do a practice session where in the perfect world, this is what you would do. You would actually practice with another car and you would drive side by side around the track. And you would do that multiple laps and corners and you'd go around the track and you'd just learn what it's like and you'd become more aware of how to see that other car and where that other car is. And you start to, if you do it enough, you get to the point where it's like, you know, I almost can't quite see that car, but I can kind of feel it. I can hear it. I know it's there. And if you do that enough, you practice that, you become really good at that. And then, you know, then you can start to do things like, okay, let's swap every straightaway. And then you can start doing things where you're offset a little bit and then offset this way. And you spend time with a partner and you practice that. That's why some, uh, some competition schools, some race schools actually do that as a driving exercise. So that is the best way of doing that. Uh, I'm going to also say that sim racing is really good for it because you can spend a lot of time side by side. The downside with sim racing is depending on your setup and rig and all that kind of stuff. You may not have the mirrors and other tools that you would in a real car, but sometimes that's not a bad thing. If you have less, then you get better at doing well with less. So I'm going to say sim racing is a good way to doing that. I would then say go and race in uh, go and race in some of the low budget endurance racing. Um, the low budget is a relative term, right? And uh, you know, you can go and do a, you can, you can go and race in one of those series from lemons to champ car to AER to lucky dog to WRL. WRL is getting to be harder to put into the low budget uh, range now, but uh, you go and race in those series. And what you'll find is you will do more passing and being passed in one day of racing than you will in a season of sprint racing. So it, it really helps you learn that quickly. Uh, okay, Nils asked, um, have you changed, modified, or expanded your approach to using the Garmin Catalyst from a few years ago when you created the 515.1 method for reviewing feedback? I have a copy of that cheat sheet included in my track bag with my Catalyst and other gear. Um, Nils, I'm gonna say mostly no. Um, I still, that's my go-to. And if anybody's wondering where that is, 
Uh, if you go to my website, speedsecrets.com, if you go to resources and you just look down, there's a thing called Catalyst 515.1. And basically what it is, is it is a, um, it's how I approach using it. And the five means if I only had five minutes, this is what I would do. If I had 15 minutes between sessions and wanted to review the information I got from the catalyst from a session, this is what I do. If I had one hour or more, this is what I would do. So I, uh, I, I created it as a simple, yeah, way to, way to start using it. And so I'm going to say mostly that's still my standard go-to when I'm using the catalyst. The only thing now is, you know, now there is the Garmin catalyst app and, um, I'm going to say that I'd still use the same process for five minutes, 15 minutes. Maybe I'd start to look at the app, uh, especially if I had somebody else, a fellow driver in a similar car uh, uh, that I could compare to. I might go to that if I had 15 minutes. If I had one hour, then I'd definitely dig into the app as well and look at some of the comparisons that I can get from that. Uh uh, Emmy asked, uh, 2024 goal is to become a data expert. Well, sorry, can't help you. No, <laughs> because I can't help, but can't you know, help you make a, become an expert. Um, anyways, currently running a garment only wanting to go to the next step. Do you have advice on what system and how to get the most out of it as fast as possible? I run a spec Miata if that helps. Um, so the, the going to something else, um, uh, I would say my experience is with Spec Miata, there is a lot of drivers that are using a name system. I, I, I want to be careful here in that I, I'm not saying that AIM would not be my first choice of data systems, uh, just because I find it a little harder to use than some other systems. And But sometimes the best advice is use what, other drivers who are be willing to share with you their information, go there. Uh, if everybody has a VBOX system, get a VBOX system. If everybody's got a MoTeX system, get a MoTeX system. Uh, if everybody's got a name system, get a name system. If you don't have that ability to share and compare, um, focus on focus on uh, the Garmin Catalyst because you can get as much out of that as you need to help you be a better driver. If you're wanting to get into some other things around uh, car stuff and stuff like that, then yes, um, go to one of those other systems. Oh, okay. So this is going back to Stuart's question. Uh, do people have a problem with too little blinking or too much blinking? Blinking as in dry eyes or too wet eyes affecting vision. Uh, yeah, so um, do drivers have that problem? I have heard of drivers that have that problem. And sometimes it might be related if you're wearing contact lenses. I know a lot of drivers who wear contact lenses, but when they get in the car, they use glasses instead. And it's for that reason. Um, so I think that you probably want to talk to your eye doctor if you're having problems with too dry or too wet. But yes, I mean, do... Do some do people have a problem with too little or too much? I've heard and I've had drivers talk to me about that, about their eyes being too dry and they're having to blink a lot. Um, and, you know, one other thing I, I caution you or have you think about is if you've got air blowing into your face, um, you know, try a session with a visor down if you're not already with a visor down. I hope you have some form of eye protection, even in a closed car, you know, even with in, in a closed car, uh, I personally have had this and I know many other drivers have as well, visor up and some piece of dirt or whatever flies in from the side or up off the floor or whatever flies up and gets into one of your eyes. So, um, yes, glasses will help that, but it won't completely stop that visor down way better solution. So those are a couple of things to think about these ready here. Okay. Um, Wow. Okay. Team Girardi Sohu's Racing. Do you have any advice on how to tactfully approach pro protesting someone's car driving or other suspected rule violations? Um, actually, I think you've answered your own question. Tactfully. 
so do I have any other, actually, do I have any other experience or advice around that? No, I don't. Uh, I, all I'm going to say is that if you get all riled up and get into somebody's face, whether it's the other team driver or any official, especially if you're doing that with another official, well, not even, no, I'm going to say especially another driver who's already kind of probably hyped up a little bit or or a lot, um, it's not going to do any good whatsoever. So do I have any advice? Calm down. Take as long as you possibly can to calm down, relax, and actually think through. And I'm going to say, you know, maybe maybe a piece of advice would be turn it around and pretend that you're in the position of the other team driver, whatever, uh, and, and put yourself into their shoes and try to see it from their perspective and then see if that impacts uh, either how you feel about the protest or maybe it changes your argument. Maybe you kind of think, oh, well, if they're thinking that, then I'm going to be prepared for this. So um, just think it through as long as possible. I know that some race series, there is a time limit that you have to put in a protest. I would, again, you know, if you have 30 minutes, put the protest in at 29 minutes. Take the first 28 minutes to calm down, really think about it rationally as much as you can, logically as much as you can after whatever. Um, so I'm going to say that's the biggest thing is calm down, relax. And if you've got more time, take more time. And absolutely for sure, getting into an official's face and being, um, what's the right term? Untactful? Distactful? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what that is. Opposite of tactful. Uh, that's not going to help. Okay. Um, Mark asked, after 10 years of tracking a Mustang, I'm tracking a thousand pound lighter 996 with the engine behind me. What should I expect to change in my driving? Uh, I, uh, my, my first instinct is to say, to say, Mark, uh, not as much as you think. And what I would do, you know, go back to what I said in the very beginning about doing sensory input session. That's what you need to do. So, you know, the biggest difference is you have a Mustang with a lot of weight up front and a Mustang with a lot of weight up front is less willing to change direction. Uh, you know, you go to turn in, you turn the wheel and all that weight up front, it just wants to keep going straight. When you're driving a 996, a rear engine car, you turn in and yes, it's going to still take a little bit of time to change direction. But now you've got that weight hanging out the back and that weight, you know, typically the old, 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 old Porsches, you know, it was like a big pendulum. It would get out there and that weight would start to come around and it would want to rotate the car, make it oversteer more. Uh, ha having said that, uh, go to any body shop in any city in the country and ask them which end of the Mustang do they repair the most. And it's always the rear of the car. Uh, Mustangs can oversteer as well, a lot, as you probably already know. So I'm going to say that, the, the you know, what should you expect to change? Not as much as you think. Uh, I'm going to say, yes, the Porsche is going to break much better than the Mustang does. One of the things that Porsches do extremely well is brake. And part of the reason is all that weight out the back, when you go to the brakes and you get some weight transfer, load transfer going forward, the weight in the back actually helps keep more load on those rear tires. And now you've got four wheels working on the brakes more than with a front engine car where you brake and you've got all that weight up in there and the rear tires are going, ah, I have no grip back here. Uh, so, uh, so for sure, I mean, braking is going to be better. Uh, the initial turning is something that you need to sense and feel. And again, going back to the sensory input sessions would be the first place I would go. Uh, how you feed in the throttle is going to change a little bit. Not a lot, but it's going to change a little bit. Uh, but I will, I, will, I will sort of end this question by saying you could drive two different Mustangs and there's going to be differences. You could drive two different Porsche 996s and depending on, you know, subtle differences or bigger differences like tires and things like that, they're going to be different. There could be that much of a difference. Bucky asked, uh, any advice on left foot braking in a car without a harness under higher G situations? 
obviously can't use left foot to stabilize my body movement using the kick plate or dead pedal. Uh, yeah, Bucky, that, that is, that's a challenge. Um, any advice, uh, the better your safety harnesses, the tighter you have them, the better your seat. Those are things that you can, you can do depending on the car, depending on the car. One thing that you could do possibly is put in what I call a heel stop. And I think I've, discussed heel stops on just about every chalk talk I've ever done. So I better do it again here. Let's say, so here's the, here's your floor of your car. Okay. Here's your, your legs coming down like this. Here's your foot. Sorry, I didn't take anatomy drawing classes in art school or art classes at, at uh, school. Um, okay. So you've got your brakes and here's the, the brake pedal like this. One of the things that practically all purpose-built race cars have is something called a heel stop, or it's something that drivers put into their purpose-built race cars. And a heel stop, if you think about this, when you're trying to apply the brakes, it's almost like your whole leg is moving and your heel is shifting like this as you you know, as the as the brake pedal goes down, so does your heel your heel. But if you put in a little heel stop, and by the way, this heel should be on the floor because your heel should be on the floor and your foot pivoting more at the ankle rather than the whole leg. But if you put in a a little angle iron or angle not iron, but you know, a piece of aluminum or nice piece of carbon fiber or something else that actually gives your foot a pivot point. So now your foot is going like this as opposed to your whole leg like this. That is going to help an awful lot stabilizing your body, but also giving your foot a pivot point to work the pedal. So that would be high on my list to try to do. Um, and again, that may not be, maybe may not be practical in your car. Then I think you got to go back to, uh the seat and the harnesses but that this little piece right here can make a big difference rob asked increasing front sway bar thickness substantially on my rear wheel drive front engine vintage racer what can i expect to feel differently trying to reduce body roll in the front and a little bit of plowing so typically again a guideline that and most race engineers would talk about this, and I've done enough of these webinars with Jeff Brown and enough of it with, with Jeff, um, stiffening the front sway bar, anti roll bar, um, by putting in a substantially thicker bar, it's going to increase understeer. It's going to increase the, the plowing. And the reason is, is that, uh, you know, the thinking here for a lot of drivers is, you're trying to re reduce the body roll. And we think that body roll is a bad thing. And uh, we think that the stiffer the car and the less the body roll, we're going to have more grip. It's actually, in most situations, not all, but in most situations, it's the opposite. We, you know, think about it. If it was like perfectly, perfectly stiff and you went around a corner and you went like this, it's actually going to pick that tire up off the track even more. If you have a softer, a smaller anti-roll bar, as you go through the corner, it's going to do this. And that tire is going to stay more on the ground. So it's going to actually have more grip with a softer anti-roll bar. If you put a stiffer one on there, it causes too much load transfer to that outside tire and reduces the grip so much on the inside tire that you actually have less overall grip. Now, so that's... Uh, when you're saying, what can you expect to feel differently? I'm going to say that stiffer bar may, in most situations, cause more understeer. Yes, there could be more responsiveness in the handling. And that's where everything, we got to look at everything as a, as a compromise. And what some drivers, so you would think, well, okay, then put the softest springs and the softest anti-roll bar in the car and you'll have more grip. And 
Yeah, you will. But the car will roll so much and it will be so slow to react that you're like turning the corner and going, uh, okay, now we're in the corner. It would just be lazy, unresponsive. So we need to find the right balance, the right compromise between having the car be stiff and reactive or having a little more grip, but a little bit less responsive. And you're trying to find that right balance. So putting that stiffer bar in there uh, may give you the feel of, oh, the car feels a lot better because I've got more response. And that might outweigh the amount of reduced grip that you have at the front of the car because of that. And you may like that more. But you're asking me what, what to expect. I would expect more understeer, but more responsiveness. That's the simple answer. Uh, probably should have started there, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, but that's that's where that's what I would uh, expect in the very beginning. Um, so again, think about that. Body roll is not a bad thing. Now, too much of it just gets lazy and uncomfortable and unresponsive. Okay. Um, and now, oh, I got to throw one last thing in here. We, I said softer and allowing the suspension to actually. Uh, work as opposed to lifting it up off the ground like this. Hope that's coming across well. I mean, I'm watching myself on the screen going, man, that looks weird. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, if you do this going around a corner, that should give you more grip to a certain point. But at some point, you can get the suspension where it's moving so much that the camber change and the toe change and all sorts of other uh, suspension geometry issues become a problem and you lose grip because of that. So just needed to put that in as a last little thing to consider. Jesse asked, what techniques might we use to expand peripheral vision and situational awareness? Oh, that's a great uh, question. And I'm gonna say, my first uh, thought on that is, practice it on the road, practice driving on the road and in traffic and when there's no traffic, like if you're driving down a country road and there's not a lot of traffic around, just driving along, just start being aware of, you know, as you're going past a tree going, what kind of tree was that that I noticed over in the side over here? There's a sign over here. I can see a house way up in the hill over here. And you're just like practice th seeing things peripherally. Like right now you could sit in a room and you could just look at you know, I'm looking at my clock on the wall back there and I can just look at that clock on the wall and I can be like hyper-focused on that. And then I can go, yeah, but what else do I see? I see the walls over here, I see over here, I see my calendar over here. You know, like I, I'm I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm practicing opening up that peripheral awareness and you can practice that on the road. Then you practice it in traffic and it's going to make you a way better driver. So get to the point where you're not counting on just like, you know, the only time I see another car in the next lane is when I look in that side mirror over there and then I see it. Um, you know, get to the point where it's like, kind of like I was talking about earlier on about practicing situational awareness and being better in wheel to wheel racing. Practice, uh, practice in driving on the road in traffic and getting to the point where it's like, I can sense that there's a car over there and you know, one of the games that I'll play when I'm driving on the road, or especially on a, like on a highway, a multi-lane highway, is, you know, I'll, I'll be looking in the mirror, in the rearview mirror, and I see the the uh, a car behind me coming up in the passing lane, and I'm watching it, I'm watching it, and it's almost like I'm going to stop looking there, and then it's going to go, where is it now? Like, I play the game of where is it now without looking at the mirror, and then I'll do a quick glance in the side mirror and go, yes, I was right, or I misjudged that a little bit. So I'm practicing that. I don't know, call me weird. Everybody else does. Uh, call me weird. I practice that kind of stuff all the time and have ever since I started driving because I thought about how that would make me a better racer. So it's something you got to practice it there. As I said earlier, you can practice it. Um, you can practice it to some extent on a simulator as well. Uh, certainly sim racing helps with it. But again, sometimes with a sim rig and setup, you don't have the same tools. You don't have the mirrors the same way. And let me let me touch on one other, one thing here right now. Uh, I recently got into somebody's car 
and started driving it. And immediately I look at the side mirrors. Well, before I started driving it, I look in the side mirrors and going, uh, these mirrors are set wrong. And how do I know that? Because I looked in the side mirror and I could see the side of my car, what the car was sitting in. I'm like, why do I need to see my car? It's not going to run into itself. Too many people use side mirrors for rear view mirrors. That's what this is for. Assuming you have one, I know there are certain race cars, especially open cockpit cars, that don't have a, a central uh, rear view mirror. But on the track, who do you, who are you more concerned with? The driver directly behind you or the driver that's just pulled out to the side looking to make a pass? I would rather know where they are. And by having my mirrors tilted out uh, on the track, I have a better view of what's beside me because that's more important than what's directly behind me. On the road, same thing. <laughs> uh, and the rule is for the rule, and this is a rule. I'm gonna say this is a rule. Uh, uh, to set your mirrors in a, in a road car, look in the side mirror, tilt your head over about like this, and then tilt your mirror out so you can just barely see the side of your own car. Bring your head back up like this. Then now you probably, you'll look in that side mirror and you can't see the side of your own car, but there's nothing there. And what is in that area back there, you'll pick up with your rear view mirror. Same thing on the right side, lean your head over like this, tilt your mirrors out until you can just barely see the side of your own car, bring your head back up. Now, with your mirrors tilted out further than many drivers, not all, uh, but if you have your mirrors tilted out further like that, you have way better awareness of vehicles around you. There's my street slash racing uh, mirror adjustment uh, tip. Zachary asked, uh, when cons I consistently have a 1% variance in lap times according to the catalyst, Garmin Catalyst during HPDEs. Is this good or should I be looking to see that change? Arnie also asked, what is a good variance? Um, so my little, uh, and, and, and I, I don't claim to have uh, come up with this, uh, somebody else did, but the way I look at the the uh, variants and the top three variants or the primarily I'm going to go with the top three variants. And the very first thing you need to do is you need to look at your lap times. And if you've only done three laps and two of them were behind in traffic, that's a pretty meaningless number. But if you did 10 laps, let's say, and you saw that four or five of them were good laps, meaning that you you weren't held up in traffic or you know somebody hadn't spun off and there was a yellow flag in a corner for three laps or something like that. If you saw that you had three or four good clean laps, then I would look at that variance and I go, if it's half a percent or lower, you got an A on your report card. Yay, way to go. Mom and dad is gonna be proud. <laughs> uh, if you were half a percent to 1%, I'm gonna say you got a B on your report card. Hey, they still, your parents, they're still proud of you, okay? Uh, if you got a, you know, one to one and a half or so, uh, you got a C on your report card, okay? If you get up to, if you get up to a, a around a 2% variance, sort of upper, you know, that upper one to two or more, then, and it wasn't, again, caused by traffic or another, sorry, you got a D on your report card. Your parents still love you, but they want you to work harder. And they want you to work harder. They want you to focus on consistency. So rather than going, how can I go faster? How can I go faster? How can I go faster? Focus on getting more consistent. So that's how I look at the top three variants. And um, top five, you can use that as well, but you need more laps to make sure that it's meaningful. Bryce, and by the way, that top var that variance piece to me is, I love that. It's a super valuable piece. Because to me, uh, if a driver is not consistent, why work on trying to go faster? Because even if you do, do go faster, you probably aren't going to know how or why you did it, you went faster. So focus on getting more consistent first and then worry about going quicker. And so I like that. The other thing that uh, I have noticed is, and this is just a, at this point, I'm going to say it's, anecdotal in a, in, a, in a way. And that is, if I see the variance being quite high, I can look at a driver's face afterwards 
and I can tell that they were trying super hard. They might even be out of breath. They, you know, they're, you know, they're, you know, sweating more than normal, that kind of thing. Uh, but if their consistency is in that, you know, A to B range, it's almost like they're not having to try so hard. Now, you know, there's a, there's a point where, you know, we're not driving around the track going, ah, oh, this is nice and relaxing. But also the opposite of that is I'm trying really hard to go fast. How many of you ever turn your quickest lap time when you try really hard? You don't. So trying to, uh, to, so using that top three variants, looking at your consistency is a good indication of how hard you're having to work at that. So let's say you turn a lap time of 130 and one, one minute 30, a minute 30, a minute 30, a minute 30. And then, but what you notice is that consistency number is getting smaller and smaller, meaning you're getting more and more consistent, but still doing the same lap time, you're improving. If you kind of go one minute 30, minute 30, minute 30, minute 30, and then you do a 129, but your consistency went up, you weren't as consistent, you know, that's a good learning step, but then it's like, okay, now to get consistent at a 129. So it's a really helpful tool metric uh, to help you focus on what's important. Bryce asks, what if you are at the top end of the rev range when entering the turn in point and you want to downshift? Don't. <laughs> Don't downshift. Uh, if you're at the top end of the rev range uh, when entering the turn in, at the turn in point, um, I'm going to say that it's unlikely that you're going to need, well, I, I, I guess maybe there's two ways of looking at this. One is you're going to have to break. So if you, uh, if you're at the, at the rev range and at the top of the RPM at the turning point, I'm assuming that you've already slowed down. In which case, if you downshift, you're just going to over rev the engine. You're going to upset the balance of the car. And, uh, I, you know, maybe this is a good time, Bryce, to use your question as one of the ways that I recommend drivers improve is go and drive the track in a taller gear than you think. So you let's say you're at top of the rev range in third gear approaching this next corner and you're like, I want to go down to second gear. If you if you downshift to that point, it's going to over rev the engine. But mm, I was going to say more important, as importantly, you're going to upset the balance of the car. And it's going to upset the balance of the car a lot to the point where you've reduced the grip level of the car, in which case you're going to go through the corner and the car is going to move around and it's going to tell you, ah, oh, yes, I'm at the driving the car at the limit. But if you actually just carried third gear to that corner, yes, you may feel like in the middle of the corner, you don't have quite the same like this. It's not going to sound as, as fast, but I can almost guarantee you'll be faster because the car is better balanced, you have more grip. And therefore, you can use that momentum going through the corner. Uh, so one of the, uh, you know, one of the things, um, and uh, I, I'm going to mention now, I'll come back to this later, but February 20 and 21, I'm doing a two-part masterclass uh, session called Self-Coaching for Drivers. And it's a masterclass because it's, to me, it's more than what I've, some of my webinars have done in the past. It's, it's more in depth and I'm going to share everything that I do in coaching. And one of the tools or strategies or tactics, whatever you want to call it. One of the things that I do a lot of times I'm in a track and I'm coaching and let's say it was Bryce, um, Bryce, I was coaching at the track. What I would do is I'd say, Bryce, I just want you to go on the track and I want you to do a session where you drive all the corners in one gear taller than you normally do. And I want you to give that a try. And I want you to work at making it work. You may feel like, oh, the engine's just bogging down in some of these corners. So what does that tell you? Make it work. M work at carrying another mile an hour or two or three through that corner. Work on flowing just a little bit more momentum through that corner. And in doing that, you're going to learn sometimes that you can take a corner quicker than you normally do. That tool, that strategy, uh, and bunch of other stuff like that, what I'm going to be covering in that uh, masterclass. But but I'm going to say that is one of, it's it's one of the most effective uh, approach, uh, approaches, tools, strategy, tactics, whatever we want to call those, um, and uh, that, that I've ever used. So 
And I'm not saying that every corner you'll end up driving in a taller gear, but what you learn by driving in a taller gear, you're going to find that some corners are actually better in that taller gear. And in other corners, you're going to go, okay, now I'm carrying more speed. I can go back to that lower gear that I was running before, but I'm now going to be starting to accelerate from a higher speed. Okay. Um, Lee said, can you shift the board to the left a bit? The right edge of the track, is that the right edge of the screen? I can do, how's that? Because uh, on my screen, it was showing to the edge there, but uh, okay, there we go. Hopefully that does it. Thanks, Lee, for pointing that out. Brian asked, in an off-camber corner, like turn two at most part, oh, one of my greatest, one of the favorite corners in the entire world, is it better to better to early apex or late apex? Assuming it's a single apex corner, I think most port turn two is possibly considered a double apex. Yes, it's considered a double apex corner. Um, so let's let me let me try to shift. Sorry, I'm just driving turn two at most port right now. It is for those of you who have not driven most port Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. I'm sorry, uh, still most port to me. Um, turn two at most port is the corner that Nikki Lauda once said is the greatest corner in the entire world, the toughest, most challenging corner in the entire world. It is a corner that most drivers will stand on the outside of the corner and watch it and go, oh, I'm not doing that. That looks too scary. And then you go and do it and you go, oh, man, does that feel good. Um, you want to see a brilliant lap at most port, go to YouTube and find Colin Brown, um, B-A or B-R-A-U-N. Most people call it pronounce it brawn, but it's brown. Um, Colin, who I coached ever since he was 12, Colin in the GTP, Nissan GTP car pole lap a couple of years ago. I think you can find it on YouTube. Oh, it is a uh, terrifying, uh, breathtaking, just wow. Anyways, I got off topic there just because I'm thinking about turn two. And thank you, Brian, for letting me think about turn two at most part. Okay. So let me Take that corner out of the way and just think about just an off camber corner. Okay, so we're coming around this left hander. It's off camber. Is it better to early apex or late apex? That's your question. I don't know. <laughs> wow, that was a long time just to get to that, right? Because um, I think I think Brian, it's gonna it's it's. I don't. I I haven't used this yet. I don't think, but it depends. It depends on what comes after that corner, and it also depends on the on the shape of the corner, the geometry of the corner as well. So um, both of those things are, are, gonna, are going to um, play a role in that. I'm just trying, I'm trying to think, is there a general uh, guideline around an early apex or a late apex in an off camber corner? Uh, and, you know, everything else being equal. And to be honest, I, I, I I can't think of, I can't think of a, well, because it's off camber and everything else being equal, I can't think of a reason why I'd say it's either an early or a late apex. Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I, I really can't. I think it depends more on the geometry of the corner, the shape of the corner and what comes after that corner. And and actually, I guess the other the other part of the the other thing to consider with an off camber corner is where is our grip, and you know if the if the track kind of falls off and then falls off even more, then you want to get the cornering the turning done uh, earlier in that corner uh, before it falls off even more. So think about more about that as using that corner where using the grip where there is grip. Ben asked, I'm struggling with a plateau in my driving. I cannot seem to get comfortable on corner entry, trying to carry more speed in, but still get to throttle early. Um, so Ben, I, 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 I think I like, I mean, I like your, your thinking here of you're trying to get more comfortable on corner entry speed because you're thinking maybe that's where your plateau is and it's possible that's where it is. Um, so, you know, what you could do is, is take a session, or more and kind of forget about the exit speed. And, and, you know, it's sometimes when we're trying to break through a plateau, 
another thing I want to talk about in this upcoming masterclass is, you know, when sometimes when we're when we're faced with a plateau, part of the plateau is caused by us being overly focused on uh, on the lap time. So maybe what you need to do, and I, you know, Ben, I don't know where you're at with all of this, but you know, forget about the lap time. Just go on track and do some sessions where forget about the lap time. Focus on trying different things and. Uh, you know, I have to be a little careful here on this chalk talk because I know I have varying experience levels. If somebody's here and they're, you know, they've been on track three times, I'm not going to say that this is the best advice. In fact, this is the wrong advice. But if it's somebody that's been on the track and been doing track days or racing for three years and have more experience, a lot of experience, or, uh, you know, a, a good amount of experience, I'm going to say, maybe it's time to experiment a bit more. And what you could do is, is rather than worrying about your getting back to power coming out of the corners and that the result of that being a good lap time, forget about that and just work on corner entry speed and start to increase your corner entry speed to the point where, wow, this is really hurting my exit now. Like when it tells you, you know, at first it might be, okay, I was a little messy. My exit wasn't as good as usual, but it's not terrible. But when it gets to the point where it's like, yeah, now it's getting pretty terrible, then you got to back it up a little bit. And what I would say in terms of trying to increase your corner entry speed is start with lighter braking. Don't think about, well, I'm just going to brake later coming to this corner and that's going to help me carry more speed in the corner. Yes, it will, but it's scary <laughs> and you're going to be tense and you're not going to, the car is going to be unbalanced. So the better way to approach increasing your corner entry speed is just brake a little lighter. So ask yourself in this corner, whatever that corner is, on a scale of one to 10, what's my braking right now? And you go, oh, I'm braking at a nine. Okay, think about coming to that corner and break at an eight. So just break a little bit lighter and that'll help you flow that speed in the corner. And by the way, the car won't be like this on its nose coming to the corner and unbalanced, it'll be flatter and more balanced and it's actually gonna have more grip. So it's actually gonna help you get carry that more, that carry more speed into the corner. So that's how I would approach that. And, and then, you know, you like kind of anything where you're trying to, you know, hone in on the, on the, the sweet spot. Sometimes you got to go a little too far this way and then come back. And if you go just a little bit too far on corner entry, but if you're doing it by breaking, by breaking a little bit lighter, then you can come to the corner and you can just hang on the brakes a little longer. If it's, if it's, uh, if it's too much, um, if you, but if you're just breaking like from a nine to an eight, you probably, I can't guarantee this 100%, but 99% of the time, you're not just going to go and sail off in the distance off the corner. You're going to come into the corner and maybe you're like, oh, I ran wide through that corner, but you learn something. And then you try it again and it's like a little wide, but a little better. And then you go through the corner and it's like, okay, I'm carrying more speed in and I'm on the right line as well. And so you learn through experimentation that way. That's how you're going to break through some plateaus. Um, and I say plateaus because, hey, we all have them. Owen asked, I drive a 500 horsepower car and am an intermediate driver. I've been told driving a lower horsepower car like a BRZ would make me a better driver. Is this true? Well, Owen, I don't know how good your driving is now, so I can't say for sure. But as a general guideline, Driving a low horsepower car will make most drivers better. Now, I know some drivers who haven't spent a lot of time in low horsepower cars, and they're fantastic. So I'm not saying that it works like that all the time, but a lot of times drivers rely too much on the power their car has, the performance of their car, and they don't learn how to really get the most out of a car. And so I've, I've had a lot of drivers switch to a lower power car and then get back, you know, a couple of years or a year later or whatever, or they keep their other car as well. And they find that they're driving better in their higher horsepower cars after that. So is it true? I'm going to say most times it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, hey, in the perfect world, you should have like, you should have lots of cars, right? So, oh, and just go out and buy more cars. That's, that's the solution to everything. <laughs> Um, but yes, yes, I would, uh, I'd say that in general, it's a good way to go. 
Bryce asked, um, last year was my first doing track days. I was graduated from novice, which, which included in-car instruction, to intermediate at the end of the season. And this upcoming year, I'll be running without another person in the car with me. Any advice on advancing like this and continuing to advance instead of running the risk of just learning bad habits? Uh, thanks for thinking like that, Bryce, because that's really smart. Um, so I would say the very first thing is, uh, just because you get signed off as solo where you can drive on track without an instructor, don't take that as a, well, I never get anybody to instruct me ever again. I just say, uh, ask for an instructor, have an instructor work with you at times. Um, I know a lot of advanced drivers who have been solo for many years who will go out of their way to ask an instructor to give them some some coaching, some feedback, whether that's in car or out of the car. So that's the, in terms of in car, ask an instructor, come along. So I would continue to get that, but have an in car instructor work with you for a period of time and then go solo again until you can feel like, okay, I've got what that instructor told me. And then find another instructor because every instructor is going to tell you something different. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other or even one's wrong and one's right but they're different. And part of becoming going from intermediate to advanced is becoming more adaptable and having more than just one way of doing something. If you can get around a track quickly using this technique and then get around the track just as quickly, but using a different technique, you become a better driver, better all around driver. So that would be the first thing. And then, you know, as you move into more experience and everything, uh, start to look at using data and video as a tool, um, whether it's yourself. So again, self-coaching or having somebody else work with you on that. And then, you know, consider a coach who may not even be in the car with you, but gives you the right tools, the right strategies, the right tactics that you should go and practice. Jesse asked, what methods can we use to practice keeping emotions in check on track? Um, brain surgery, that's the, you know, just go into a neurosurgeon and have part of your brain removed, that emotion part of your brain. I know some drivers that seem like they've done that because they have no emotion, just no emotion. And people go, Kimi Raikkonen, no. <laughs> uh, but um, <clears throat> so Jesse, that's a really, uh, it gives me a chance to kind of talk a little bit about this is as humans, as drivers, we do what we do because we're programmed to do so. Think about that. We do what we do because we're programmed to do that. Sometimes we don't do what we want because we don't have the right programming yet, or sometimes we just access the wrong program. So an example of this is somebody mentioned earlier heel and toe downshifting. Some of you are on here going, I don't know how to heel and toe. That's because you don't have the right programming yet. You haven't built the right mental programming to put your foot in the right position, to brake, flip the throttle, time all that the right way. You don't have the right programming to do that yet. Now, if you practice it over and over and over again, you would build the right mental programming to do that. <clears throat> now, every now and then, <clears throat> I have been heel and toe downshifting for 50 years. And <clears throat> every now and then, I won't get a perfect. I don't even think about it anymore. It's just a program that just like, I cannot downshift without heel and toe downshifting. It's just something that just happens. It's like, you know, it's like breathing to me. But every now and then, it's not quite perfect. Does that mean that I've lost my programming? No, I just maybe access the wrong part of that programming or something else. So that's the first part. Now think about that in terms of, uh, you know, so as we learn, we build more programming, okay? Emotions are the same thing. Do you know anybody who put them in a stressful situation, and they pretty much always respond the same way. I bet you do. You And that may be the right way or a good way, and sometimes it's not so good. So the biggest thing here is we need to build a program for how we deal with the things that happen on a track, your emotions, your state of mind, all of that kind of stuff. And you can use mental imagery uh, to do that. You can use so you could be, you could, you know, every night for three weeks in a row, close your eyes, relax, breathe, 
get yourself, your brain slowed down into a very receptive state. See yourself in the car driving and let's say in a racing situation, you're coming through, you're coming to a brake zone, you're coming in there and somebody just comes sailing down the inside and forces you off the track and you're like, ah, no, it's okay. I'll get it later. And you run through that, that kind of a, a situation over and over and over again so that you learn to program your responses, your emotional responses to different situations. And what I would recommend is that you actually add a mental trigger to that. And you know, your trigger could just be calm, could be relax, it could be look ahead. Don't worry about that that just happened. Just look ahead. So every time that you do this in your mind, this mental imagery, you do that. Every time you do that, you go calm. And, you know, it could be zen, you know, mm, you know, that kind of a thing. Like, but build a trigger around it so that every single time you just say that word, it triggers that mental program for dealing with it. So now you're on track. Somebody sails it down the inside, almost clears out the side of your car, forces you off track. You could go calm. And that's how you manage your emotions. Uh, Vola's asked, uh, Ross, your virtual track walks are gold. Thank you. Uh, I think Peter Krause is on here somewhere. Is Peter on today? Hey, Peter. Oh, there he is. Oh, I'm looking right there. Uh, hi, Peter. Um, so the, the thanks, um, at least at least 50% of those thanks uh, or the uh, comment about them being gold uh, go to Peter. And Peter, I think I know where this is going. Are you planning to do more of those with Peter Krause? No, I hate Peter. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I hear you know at least a couple of European tracks very well too, meaning the Nürburgring and Spa. Yeah, Peter and I were going to going to the Nürburgring, and we're just going to spend uh, a year over there doing a virtual track walk. Right, Peter? Um, uh, so, first of all, Peter and I are currently in the process of redoing some of our virtual track walks. Uh, I'd love to say exactly when they'll be ready. Um, I don't know. We're uh, actually, we're doing some more recording tomorrow, actually. So we're Nick, right in the middle of doing some stuff and we're doing them in a different way this time that I think, I'm hoping we can turn gold into platinum. So that's, that's our goal and uh, to make them even better. So we're redoing some of them and eventually maybe all of them that we've done uh, to make them, more efficient for you and updating. Uh, man, over the past year, we've had tracks, uh, uh, Road America, Mid Ohio, Laguna Seca, uh, all resurfaced. And what's the other one? Uh, something else just got, uh, uh, anyways, one of them just got another one. So we're redoing some of those things because tracks change as well. Are we going to do some European tracks? Mm, to be determined. <laughs> uh, to be determined. Uh, I can't answer that on the grounds of no. Uh, okay, Sue asks, can you talk more about driving according to your suspension? Uh, can you talk more about driving according to your suspension? Um, I think what you're asking here is is how do you respond? How do you how do you find, how do you sense the limits of your car with the setup on your car being different, okay? Um, so, so the very first thing, or one of the first things I talked about in this chalk talk was doing sensory input sessions. Uh, and that, that will make a driver become more sensitive to whatever the setup, the suspension setup on their car is is like, um, so that's the first thing in terms of, well, how do you drive according to it? Your your job as a driver is to drive your car to the limits, no more, no less, okay? That's your that's the job description. And, but if you have a car that's very softly sprung and soft anti roll bars, like I was talking about with answering one of those questions earlier about a stiffer anti roll bar, you know, if you've got a very soft suspension, you might have to, uh, if you're coming up to a corner and you know that the car is going to kind of be a little lazy on turn in, then you're going to have to anticipate just a little bit. You're going to have to come up to that corner and just start to initiate the turn just a tiny bit earlier. Uh, and I'm not talking like 
I'm talking like maybe six inches a foot, you know, like you know, half a meter at most kind of thing, a little different in, in terms of how responsive it is. Now, if you have a car that's super hyper responsive, then you got to be a little slower with your steering input. Uh, I just on my Substack, and I suspect many of you are subscribers to my Substack articles. I just started, uh, just did one last week around the timing and rate of turning the steering wheel. And that's kind of related to the suspension stuff. Uh, and I've got another article coming out on Wednesday, I think it is, uh, um, that I've scheduled for the next kind of follow up on the, on the conversation around how do you adapt the timing and rate of how you turn the steering wheel. So that's part of it as well. Um, I, I, I'm trying to. Th I'm trying to think if there's. I'm going to leave. So I'm going to. I'm going to leave this here because I. I'm not 100% sure whether I've answered it as much as I want to answer that, but I can't think of it right off the top of my head. So, okay, uh, Heather, hi. Um, I came late to track driving, TT mostly, having started in my early 50s, and after the 2023 season, I had a mid back thoracic compression fracture, not related to driving. Um, my GP and neurosurgeon don't have a clear picture of what I do on track, so they're not sure how uh, to advise me without asking you or anyone here to give medical advice. Is there any kind of clearinghouse or forum where an otherwise fit but late 50s driver can get good advice about how to prep for the upcoming season versus whether it's time to hang up the keys? Um, and... Dennis responded. I uh, see I missed that, but thanks, Robin. Dennis uh, to Heather, talk to an occupational therapist about light back braces. Use a racing five, point, five or six-point harness. Recommend by me. Yes. Max suggested finding a doc who works pilots and or military. Wow. Okay. First of all, thanks for those of you who chimed in there. And Heather, this is really great stuff. Um, sorry about the compression fracture. Um, so first of all, first of all, I know a driver who has had a um, compression fracture uh, in his back and has been using one of those back braces, and it has helped him a lot. Uh, I can't say it's perfect, but it's helped him a lot. And it's really, I guess there's there you know there's part of it is the uh, you know as you're recovering, uh, you know it helps that way. Like it just helps in terms of. Um, helping protect it. There is a proactive piece that, you know, it may be that you want to wear it going forward. I know some drivers who like the feeling of one of those back braces that cinch around the waist in their car because it helps their body. It helps support that. And, you know, so that can, that can help. Um, I would highly recommend working with a, um, a fitness trainer, um, you know, the occupational um, therapist uh, is a is a great place to start. But I would also suggest working with somebody who's experienced in motorsport. So my go to is Trey Shannon. He's a pit fit in Charlotte area. Um, so if you go to pit fit, um, that's all one word. I can't remember what the website is pit fit dot com. But if you go to pit fit um, uh, and uh, Pit Fit was started by, and why can I not remember his name? See his face. Uh, Pit Fit is probably the premier uh, fitness for drivers facility in or training centers in the U.S. Um, they have, the main one is in Indy, who works with all the different drivers at that level. Uh, Trey is in Charlotte, works with a lot of drivers down there. Now, I know there are some other ones. Um, Oh, and there's a really good one in LA area, Southern California area. Uh, oh man, hopefully I'll remember this as we go along. Um, so, but I would suggest working there because they understand what your body is going to going through, and um, that will that will make a difference. Um, so those things, um, I, I, there are go to go to the track. Uh, on go to any track at any event on any weekend and you're going to find <laughs> you're going to find a doctor and so i'm not going to give you the advice that a doctor is going to give you but for example 
two and a half months ago, I had two artificial discs installed in my neck. Um, so I had two, two uh, uh, discs removed and replaced with artificial discs. And the great thing is for me, my surgeon happens to do some track days. So he's like, I know what it's like to wear a helmet and a Hans device. And he says, give it three to four months and you'll be good. Uh, so, and so I'm almost there. Uh, so, you know, finding somebody that's, that's, uh, had some experience on track, I'd, I'd say is also a good thing. So occupational therapist, uh, finding, trying to spend a little time just digging around and trying to find somebody that, that also has a little insight into motorsport and has been there and done that. Um, uh, so I'm going to say that, you know, the one thing though, definitely strengthening your lower back. I've also had surgery on my lower back as well many years ago and the strengthening exercises that I did around that has made it pretty darn good ever since. Okay. You know how I can tell that we're moving along here? So we're an hour and 20 minutes in. You know how I can tell we're, we're moving along here is my cards uh, have switched from red pen to purple pen, which tells me that Robin's gone through a pen already. So, <laughs> uh, so that's how I know. Yeah. Uh, Jesse asked, uh, what are your thoughts on use of stability and or traction control as a self-coaching tool for a novice? Ooh, that is a really interesting way to look at that question. I've been asked the question about, you know, nanny's on or nanny's off, you know, electronic uh, stability control and traction control. Should drivers be using it or not? And um, <clears throat> so can it be used as a self-coaching tool? Yes. And here, here's my thoughts. Um, a lot of it depends on what your objectives are in terms of going to a track. If your objective is to go wheel to wheel racing and move up the ladder and become a professional race driver, yes, for sure, there's a point in time where driving around with all the electronic nannies helping you is not a good thing. You've got to learn the car control that comes from having those turned off. If your goal is not to be a pro race driver or you're realistic enough to know that the likelihood of that is happening is is slim, then think about it as you're there to learn you and your car. If you drive your car on the road all the time with the stability control and all of that on, then drive like that on the track. So that's one way to think about it. I'm going to say the most important thing, and this is getting to Jesse's question specifically about the self-coaching tool for a novice, is if you are not aware of when stability control slash traction control, any of the nannies, if you're not aware of when they're coming in and helping you, do not turn them off. Absolutely do not turn them off. If you get to the point where it's like, oh, I know, I, oh, that just, I, I felt that come in there. Oh, I knew that. I felt that come in there. Then you're starting to realize where it's helping you and where it's not helping you and or where it's not actually contributing. Um, and that's that's a sign where you're getting to the point where it's like, okay, I can, I'm, I'm aware of it. And by the way, this is not like, well, 50% of the time I can get it. No, you need to be like 99.9999% of the time. You know, you can sense when it's come in and why it's come in and helping you, why the stability control has kicked in and, and it's helping you. So, uh, so that's how, you know, coming up to that point is critical. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's um, uh, so yeah, having that sensitivity is really important. I actually, I love driving a car on track with the nannies turned on. And I know a lot of people go, why? I'm going, I love trying to figure out how can I use that? How can I like have it like, so it's kind of just, I want to play with that. I want to come into a corner and go, I get the car to rotate just enough. And it goes, Kick! and it just helps me just a little bit, just that tiny little bit. And it's like, it's like the stability control is tickling the car. Like it's not poking at it. It's not shutting the whole thing down. It's just helping me a little bit. But it's almost to the point where it's like, um, I've got the car rotating. It's going to come in. There it is. And it's like, I can predict it. And when it's like that, now it's become a tool that I can use. And by the way, you know, if you want to be a top level pro driver, get used to it as well, because there's a lot of, modern race cars that have stability control, traction control. 
and you need to learn how to use it and you you know need to learn how to adjust it even because in a lot of those cars you get to the point where you're your truck you're you're changing the slip and gain on it and everything and you're using that beyond jesse's question of for a novice so yes i'm going to say though as a novice you have enough on your plate or enough in your brain to work on just keep the stability keep the nannies turned on and only when you get to the point and by this point you're probably not a novice anymore but only when you get to that point where you can sense and almost to the point of being able to predict when it's going to come in to help you that's when you could consider turning it off now, and again you could go yeah but you know what i want to drive my car home at the end of the end of the day i don't want to take any chances i'm going to just leave it on fantastic then learn to work with it Think about trying to come up to it and go in. I just want to come in and maybe just, just, you know, it just kind of clicks on one time. It's kind of like getting into the ABS, you know, get to the point where it's like you can come in the, on the brakes and you squeeze on the brakes, squeeze on, squeeze on. And there's just like, tick, and there's like that little bit, like you, you are, you're at that limit, just barely touching the, the ABS. Greg, if you were to focus on, Greg asked, if you were to focus on one thing, would it be highest min speed in corners or earliest return to wide open throttle? Yes. How's that? <laughs> uh, yeah, Greg, it, I mean, this is the classic. It depends. Uh, it depends on where you are in the development as a driver, as yourself, as a driver. It also depends on the type of corner. You know, if it's a, if it's a, slower corner leading onto a straightaway, highest priority is going to be wide open throttle. If it's a fast sweeping corner, and maybe even one that doesn't have a lot of straightaway afterwards, I want highest min speed. Um, you know, again, as general guidelines, those are not, don't take that as the rules, but as general guidelines that, um, you know, as a novice, focus on wide open throttle first. As you progress in your development, then start to focus more on the highest min speed again as a general guideline. Arden asked, what would your suggestion be for the off camber turn three at Thunder Hill? Um, smile because it's a fun corner. Uh, you pop up over the hill and you come down and um, what would my suggestion be? Uh, I mean, for sure there's a line there and it is a late apex corner, but I'm going to say the late apex, kind of going back to, I can't remember, was it Bryce that asked the question? But the, anyways, um, so, you know, earlier on there was the question about whether you use an earlier an apex, earlier or late apex in off-camber corners. And, you know, turn three has a late apex, but it's not, to me, it's not, it doesn't really have anything to do with the camber of the corner. It has to do what comes up next. Um, okay, maybe, yeah, not, no, I mean, you know, the apex, I think if that, tr if that corner was not off camber, but it was flat, I think the apex would be in the exact same place. I think the, the tricky part of turn three is also where do you enter the corner from? Because if you move the car, and for those of you who haven't been to Thunder Hill before, don't know it, I'm not going to go into great detail, but it's a, you're coming up a big, long, fast, sweeping left-hander, and then you come to the right-hander turn three, you pop up over the hill, and it's a very late apex around the corner here. And, you know, do you get the car set up all the way over to that far left side? Do you kind of enter the corner for more mid-track? I'm going to say most times, for most cars, it's somewhere in that half to two-thirds of the way over, not all the way, all the way over there, because I think the track falls away even more. So, again, part of it, I think, is spending time where there's grip. Ilyas, what's a good way to go about optimizing the middle section of a corner complex? I turn ten, turn eight, nine of the seven to 10 complex at Indy. Assuming the driver can be at the limit the whole way through and prioritize the exit, is it just trial and error? Um, simple answer is yes, it's just trial and error. You've got to find out what the best compromise is. And, uh, you know, that whole complex of turns seven to 10, again, not getting into great details because some, a lot of people on here may not have been there, but, um, you know, you want to get, you want to maximize your entry into turn seven and you want to maximize your exit out of turn 10. 
what you do in eight and nine is kind of, uh, it's dictated by those other things. At the same time, you can be, you can compromise too much in there. So you want to get the car, you want to hustle through that section. I mean, so I'm a big believer in this idea of having triggers, uh, uh, triggers for everywhere I go around the track. Every time I come up to a corner or a section of track, I have little triggers. And that whole section is, to me, it's hustle in, hustle, exit speed. So it's carry speed into seven, it's hustle through eight and nine, and then but focus on the exit out of 10. The hustle part though, you've got to hustle as much as you possibly can, but have the car in the right position so that you can exit out of, out of, out of uh, turn 10. You can sacrifice a little bit of eight to maximize the speed you carry through seven. I know some people come through turn seven there and be so caught up and focused on getting the car set up back over to the left for turn eight that they don't maximize the speed through seven. I'd rather see you carry more speed through seven and compromise a little bit of eight, compromise a little bit of nine, still hustling, but compromise a little bit in nine to get set up so to get a better exit out of 10. But yes, it's trial and error. It asks, can you comment on Apex Pro versus Garmin or other coaching tools? I think Apex Pro learns and shows available grip to help improve your times. Uh, obvious opportunities compared to Garmin showing optimum as best as your best. Am I thinking of this incorrectly? Um, and Robin wrote a note here. Peter answered partly. Uh, man, I'd love to see what Peter said. Um, so, uh, um, it both of the both of the, the bottom line is both those devices cannot predict the future. It cannot predict that, oh, that corner has got more grip. It can't do that. The Apex Pro can't do that. The Garmin Canalyst can't do that. The only thing it can do is go, oh, you went through this section of track or you went through another section of track and you used more grip, so why aren't you using it here? That's about all it can do. And, you know, going through the example of, of we've talked twice now about off-camber corners. You can go through a corner and let's say your car pulls 1.2 G. You go through a corner 1.2 G and then you get to another corner that's off camber or the surface is different and you go through that corner at 1 G. Well, do you want either one of those devices to tell you go through that corner at 1.2 G when it's not capable of doing that? I hope I hope you don't want that because uh, you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> um, so neither of them really can tell you what the limit is. It's basing it on what you have done. And, you know, you know, yes, you could go and hire Max Verstappen to hop into your car and go through those corners and and tell you that, yeah, your car can go through there at 1.25 Gs in that one corner. And then you can go, okay, well, now I've got something to compare to. But short of that, um, neither one of those devices can actually tell you what the grip level is. And by the way, is it possible that the grip level this afternoon is not the same as it was this morning or you know yesterday was really hot today it rained overnight and now it's cool today you think that's changed yeah so that's why none of those devices can actually tell you all, all they can really do is base it off of what you've done and what it learns from you and the great thing is they're learning as you go Ian, so Ian asks, so for coaching for a fee, is it possible to send a lap or two video of a track day and you analyze and give it feedback? Um, it's possible, but, but I will say it's not the highest priority for what I'm doing right now because I just have so many other things on my plate. Um, Peter Kroos, if you want to put your hand up, uh, I know Peter has been doing that and Peter wants to make a comment and say, yes, send it to me. Uh, I'm happy for Peter to do it. Um, so, yes. Uh, it's it's one of those things that um, I love doing, but it's it's just, it's, it's a bit time consuming for uh, all the other things I've got going. Okay. Brian, <laughs> walk Mossport, please. Uh, I'm assuming, Brian, you're asking for Peter and I to do a virtual track walk for Mosport. 
Yes, it is high on our priority list. And, you know, the thing is, um, Peter and I recorded one for most part just prior to COVID, uh, recorded some stuff just before COVID. Uh, and in around that time, they did some resurfacing and enough changes that we both we both just went, you know what, we got to start from scratch again. So, yes, it is high on our priority list. Peter? You listen to this, right? We got to get our butts in gear and get those done. <laughs> uh, Bucky asked, uh, any advice on your solution for handling understeer when you're near the apex and already starting to accelerate? Bucky, but the only thing you can do there, well, so the main thing you can do there is you've got to breathe the throttle. You've got to hesitate with the throttle. And I'm going to say that sometimes, um, it, I'm so a, I'm going to answer this question first in terms of you're in the moment. It's not like we're talking about the next lap. We're talking about right now. You're in the moment. You're near the apex. You've already started to accelerate and now you got some understeer. That to me is a sign that you probably started to accelerate too soon or started to feed in too much too, too quickly. So the only thing you can do at that point is to stop feeding in uh, throttle. So you gotta kind of hesitate a little bit. Um, if the understeer is really bad, you're gonna have to, unfortunately, you're gonna have to do a little bit of a, just a tiny lift, to try to get a little bit of load on that front end again to get the car to turn. But at the same time, as, you're, as that's happening, you're going, note to self, next lap, be a little more patient with the throttle or work on my timing and rate of release of the brakes to get the car to rotate, to get the car pointing so I've got less wheel in it at that moment that I am going to power. So those are the two ways of doing that. Um, with understeer, there are things you can do with the steering wheel. And it depends on, depends on, depends on the car, the track, a bunch of things, right? But one of the things that you could do is, you know, you can be going through that corner and you get some understeer. The, the best way to cure understeer is actually to straighten the wheel up a little tiny bit, bring the, the wheels back to an angle where they can grip the road. But there are times where, you can also just go, I'm just going to feed in just a tiny bit more and just ask a little bit more of the front tires. I'm going to say that's a pretty rare occasion, but if you do a little bit of a, you know, a little hesitation or a breathe of the throttle, just a tiny bit while giving it just a tiny bit more, it, the car might turn. Now you're pointing at a better angle so you can continue to feed in the throttle. But again, as all that's happening, you should be going note to self. What am I going to do next lap? So just so you know, we're 25 minutes or so um, from the uh, estimated <laughs> uh, completion time. Uh, and thanks for continuing with this. I know some of you maybe dropped off. Some of you are uh, still continue on here. And this is so much fun. Uh, 49ers game. There's a 49ers game. Who cares about that? Can I, can I make a comment? No, no. I'm not going to make a comment, the difference between football and driving. But just remember. Uh, anyways, I'm not going there. Uh, what, what was it that Hemingway said? There's only three sports in the world, uh, bullfighting, uh, mountain climbing, and auto racing. Those are the only three sports in the world. Yes, they're just games. Okay. Anyways, uh, Ron asked, uh, I watch many track videos where the drivers do a lot of sawing of the steering wheel in turns. Thank you for bringing this up, Ron. Based on their speed, it doesn't appear to be a search for front end grip, but more of an inaccuracy for turning. Should the goal of turning to dial in, should the, should the goal of turning to dial in the correct amount of steering to avoid this sign, uh, to be to, um, uh, as, as an aside, Max Verstappen is very smooth in turns. Yes. So, I see a lot of drivers. I've watched videos and to the point of, sorry, who asked me to <laughs> look at a video? Uh, I can't, Ian asked. Um, I do watch a lot of in-car videos and I see drivers sometimes going through a corner and they're doing this all the way through. And <clears throat> that, uh, I've, had, I've asked drivers, why are you doing that? And they'll go, well, I'm searching for the grip. I'm going, well, actually what you're doing is you're, re you're reducing the grip. So if you kind of went, 
the perfect ideal is that's the perfect ideal movement of the steering wheel, something like that, right? It's not this through the corner. When you watch drivers on track and you see this, it's a, re so I'm talking elite level pro drivers. It's a, it's a reaction. It's a feedback coming through the wheel. It's either the tires feeding back through the steering system and kicking the wheel and the drivers controlling the kickback in the steering wheel, or as you point out here, some of it is drivers are making small little adjustments and we make those adjustments. If you never ever, if I also, so if I watch a video, somebody sends me a video and I watch it and I see a lot of this, I'm going, stop turning the steering wheel. If I see a driver go through a corner and go, I go, you're not driving the car at the limit. So if there's no adjustments and the steering wheel is just perfectly smooth, you're probably not driving the car at the limit. You're not having to make any adjustments because the car is not asking it, you know? So, so Ron, do you, you know, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, should the goal of turning be to dial in the correct amount of steering to avoid this sign? Yeah, that's the goal. But if you never make an adjustment, you're probably not driving the car at the limit. So it should be that. And yes, Max Verstappen is very smooth in turns. Many years ago, uh, I took as many in-car videos of Formula One drivers from a season. And I looked at you know, all we really could see was in car and the steering movements. And I took, uh, I'm going to say at least eight drivers at probably three or four tracks each. And I took probably close to 10 minutes of each of their drivings. And I kind of went, you know, here's Michael Schumacher, here's Mika Hakkinen, here is Jacques Villeneuve, here is Damon Hill, because I, I think it was all there. Jensen Button, who I and so I looked at that and I looked at all of them and I went, one driver stands out as having less steering movement, and it was Michael Schumacher. So there's something there. You know what? The good drivers, they're really good. But you know what's really interesting, and I've said this a million times, I'm gonna say it here because this is a great uh, point to put this in here, is what they're doing is the same thing that you do. People look at Max for stopping and go, what is that super trick thing that he's doing? Nothing. He just does the basics better than anybody else. He's just turning the steering wheel. That's a, how much more basic does it get than that? He just turns the steering wheel better than most drivers. And that's what separates him from others. So um, just do the basics better. Get really, 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 really good. And even more reallys in there at doing the basics. Okay, Art asks, can you address the blending of trail braking into slow to medium corners with rolling in maximum V min speeds? Okay, yes. Okay, so now this has just gone into rather than about uh, 20 minutes or so left, we're going to spend another three hours. Okay, you guys all good on that? Thanks, Art. <laughs> um, can I address the blending of trail braking into slow to medium corners with rolling in maximum V min speeds? Okay, so we're going to use this right here. We use my red car here. Um, I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can because Art, I did a whole master class last year. Um, yeah, beginning of last year on braking and corner entry speed. And I will be doing one again in the near future. Um, and <clears throat> so I, I can't, I can't, because that ended up being a three part thing. So that was probably like, well, at least four hours. So I can't take four hours, but I will spend a, a couple minutes here, okay? So let's say we begin braking here. And here, I'm gonna do it over here. Bob, otherwise known as begin a braking, okay? So begin braking. Break, 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 break. Down to the turn in point here. There's the turn in point. And then from here, And right here is the EOB or end of braking, okay? So that's the, and this is trail braking, okay? Um, so there's that. As I said earlier, there's a zone. I'm gonna say the zone is, let's say it's, no, nah, not even that far, sorry. 
I'm going to scale here. I'm going to say in this area here, you are doing what I call fine tuning. You're fine tuning your corner entry speed and the load that you want on the front of the car. As you know, trail braking helps keep the, the, low, the front end loaded, right? Which is why we trail brake more in a tight corner like this, a slower corner like this. Um, so, but we get down here, and to me, there's a right here, there's a decision that we're making. And the decision is, first of all, speed, oops, and second, load, okay? So, in around this point here, you have to go. Am I going too slow? In which case, I'm going to start to release the pedal. Just I'm going to my the timing of of my release of the brakes is a little earlier. I'm going to start to release a little sooner. Or am I like, ooh, I'm carrying a lot of speed in this corner. I'm going to wait, and I may not even. So if I've overslowed, I might start releasing the brakes here. If I've if I feel like I haven't slowed enough, I may end up not releasing the brakes until here, like I start releasing. And then is the is the release a slow release of the brake pedal or is it a quick release of the brake pedal? So that's the timing and rate of release. So we get the timing and rate of release of the brakes, okay? Um, and that helps us here. So you're talking about rolling in corner and min speed. You know, your min speed in a corner, So, you know, there is a point in time in here. Okay. There is a point in time where you're probably not doing anything. And yes, in a book, many, many, many years ago, I wrote a book and it said, you should either be on the brakes or on the gas. And again, it's kind of like that, you know, the ideal of the, of the turn your steering wheel is this. That's the ideal. But in reality, it's never that. And there is going to be some amount of, uh, some people will say, oh, you're coasting. I'm going to say you're hesitating. And what's happening here is you're, you are determining, is the car on this angle? In which case, it's kind of not ideal to come out of the corner, right? Or is the car on this angle? And, you know, we're coming back here. If the car is in this angle, you may start to pick up the throttle here. If the car is on this angle, you may not be able to pick up the throttle till here. So what you've done back here with managing the load is going to have an impact on how much rotation the car has and the angle that it's pointing at so that as you come out of the corner, you're on the right angle and you can get back to power soon. So there's a decision point here around rotation. And, you know, where is the minimum speed in the corner going to be? Uh, let's use it for that. So your minimum speed in the corner, probably on this situation right here, is going to be right about there. Why? Because you've been braking, and right here, if you haven't gone back to power yet, right about here, you're starting to pick up power. Your minimum speed is going to be somewhere right around there. Apex of the corner, though, is right here. So your min speed may be before the apex. Guess what? This isn't the case in every single corner. This is just an example of this corner here, how I've drawn it here, right? Your min speed could be right here. Your min speed could be back here. Your min speed could be here. It could be here. So where your min speed is, is also a factor. And it's going to be dependent on how much straightaway there is afterwards, the shape of this corner. You know, is it off camber? Is it cambered? All that kind of stuff. So there is there is all of that to consider as well. <sighs> okay. So I'm going back to your question, or can you address the blending of trail braking into slow to medium corners with rolling in maximum V min speeds? Uh, I think the combination of all these things. Now, I could get into a big, long conversation about how do you approach it if you're like, I want to increase my corner entry speed. Uh, you know, Do you brake later? Do you shift the brake zone in? Do you brake lighter? Do you come out the brakes? Uh, or that's a bigger, bigger question, I think, right now. I think the biggest thing is start to think about, you know, in here you make a decision. And first of all, I'm going to say when you're way back here, don't get overly focused on this. Spend more time thinking about this 
and what you're going to do when you get down there because this begin a breaking point probably is going to change a little bit partially depend on how well you got out of the previous corner was there traffic back there was there you know all sorts of things your speed when you get to this point here might be a little different in which case you might your beginner breaking might be a little bit later it might be a little earlier how do you adjust how do you sense that how do you know where it should be because you look here and go what do i need to do when do i need to start breaking to be at the right speed angle all that kind of stuff when i get down to here you're making a lot of decisions down here as you can see okay okay all right i hope that helped a little bit without trying to um yeah, without without spending four hours at it. <laughs> cotton, hey cotton. He's got a revised, oh. so go go on. Uh, this one? Should I yeah, yeah. do this? Okay, cotton asked. No, no, no. Oh, somebody he's, else's. Okay. <laughs> he's revised it. Okay, so cotton's cotton's revising his uh, uh, his question. Okay, and I trust cotton on corner two at most part. Um, Casey asks, recently made a change from a factory power brake to non-boosted dual master brake system with a bias bar. Any tips on tuning bias? Considering setting up wheel speed sensors, I can feel fronts or rears lock, but difficult to hone in on the braking limits by axle. Um, um, let's see how far I go back here. So first thing, I, you know, I, and I don't know what kind of car this is, um, you know, your brake bias in a rear engine Porsche is going to be different than in a, going to the example we had earlier on is a front engine Mustang. Um, your brake bias might be different, is going to be pr different there. And, you know, if you think, just, let me just kind of back way, way up. Why do we have brake bias? Um, think about it. When you brake, most of the braking's being done by those front brakes because, um, because they, you know, you've got more load on those front tires. They have more grip. They're doing more, most of the That's why cars have bigger brakes on the front of them than they do on the rear. As I said earlier, you know, if you've got a front engine car, a lot of that weight's already up there. If you're in a Porsche with the engine hanging way out the back, most of the weight's back there. So it keeps the car a little bit of balance. So as a wild example here, uh, in a front engine Mustang, your front bias maybe you know I'm, I'm trying to think about uh you know it may be uh you may have like 58 to 60 percent i'm just pulling numbers out of the midair here 58 to 60 percent of the brake bias on those front on the on the front brakes and 40 to 42 percent on the rear in a porsche with the engine back there you know you might only have 53 54 percent of the bias on the front tire on the front brakes and 47 or 46 47 or so on the rear there okay so there's that um the here's the the, the classic way to start the very first time you have a brake system with a balance bar you have the car sitting up in the air on jack stands <clears throat> you have somebody get into the car and push down on the brake pedal either way either left or right foot and they push down the brake pedal and you or somebody is at the front wheel and they're like turning the wheel they're turning the front one of the front wheels and they're turning it and they're turning it and as the driver pushes down the brakes eventually they go i can't turn it anymore and the driver goes okay hold it there hold it hold that pressure quickly go to the back wheel and they turn the back wheel and the back wheel should still be able to turn a little bit because it doesn't have as much bias in those front tires so if it's like, wow, rear is just spinning around. Okay, you got way too much bias on the front and not enough in the rear. If you go back there and you go, I can't turn the rears either. Then you go, okay, now let's start this again. Okay, driver, take your foot off the brake, start applying it, and you're turning the rear wheel. And you're at that point where it's just like, okay, it locks. And you go to the front and you're like, I could turn the fronts a little bit. Okay, you've got too much brake bias. So what you want to do is get to the point where, you know, that front just turn or just locks up like stops when you're trying to turn it and you go to the rear and you can just barely still turn it that's probably going to give you that bias of somewhere around in that 55 to 60 percent of the bias to the front and 40 45 or so uh to the rear and that's not a bad place to start okay that's just an idea uh or a, 
a, a, a starting point for, for doing that. Then you go to the track and you start tuning that. And hey, in the perfect world, what you do is you go on the track and on a practice session and you have some old tires in the car and you go and you just, you get to the point where you just break harder and harder and harder until you get a lockup. And if the lockup feels like, if you're like, you get to that point where all of a sudden the car goes like this and you're having to catch the rear end, the rear tires have locked up. If you're in a solid rear axle car, you're probably going to get some wheel hop as well. And uh, But if you get that back end kind of squirreling around on you back there, that's telling you the rears have too much bias, in which case you dial some to the front. If you come in and you brake too hard and the steering kind of goes numb, like you could turn it and the car wouldn't do anything, it would just keep going straight ahead that tells you you've got too much bias to the front, in which case then you dial a little bit to the rear and you can do that. Now, you can you start using data with wheel speed sensors and all that kind of stuff um, to help you watch for that so that you don't have to, uh, you know, the downside is you may end up locking up and flat spotting a tire doing that, doing that. If you're good at it, if you you can sense it and just, you know, you get a tiny lock and you immediately release, but you've you've noticed it immediately that, the steering either went numb or the car kind of got loose in the rear, okay? So that's the best way. And then you can start, like I said, using data to kind of maybe get a little closer. And <clears throat> if you're watching uh, wheel speed, uh, the wheel speed sensor, and if you get just like a little, like just a tiny little bit like that, it's like, okay, you're getting a tiny bit of lock up on whatever channel you're looking at, left rear or right front or whatever it is. Okay, uh, go to Cotton's question now. And we just got a couple more questions, then we're going to wrap up. Okay, Cotton. Um, is turn two at most sport still off camber? <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, I would say no after the last several resurfacings and sight line changes. I have hundreds of laps before and after. Also, some instructors roll a ball down the hill to prove it is not camber. I agree. Um, it feels off camber. And... Uh, and and Cotton, I have not driven the car since they resurfaced or the track since they resurfaced it. So I trust you a thousand percent. Um, Cotton can drive anything. <laughs> uh, so I trust him a thousand percent. And uh, um, but I'm not even I don't I don't think that it was necessarily I don't think it was off camber ever, but it always felt off camber. And the reason it felt off camber, as you know, is. You pop up over the hill and it drops, I don't know, feels like it drops uh, 10 stories down a 10-story building in a matter of a few feet at almost flat out as fast as the car can possibly go in top gear. Um, so it feels like you're cheating death when you go down there. And because it falls away so much as you come down there, it feels off camber. But like you point out, I don't think it is. Um, thanks for pointing that out. For all you most part fans. And if you've never been there, you got to go. You got to go experience Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. Um, got an email from a fellow the other day who's going for the first time, and I'm just like, it is. It is when people say, "What's your favorite track to drive?" I go, "Motorsport." It's just the favorite track to drive in the world. I've driven the Nurburgring. I've driven Spa. I've driven, you know, tons of different drives. Phillip Island in in Australia. I've got I've got some laps in. Uh, you know, I. And most sport is just, it's one of those tracks when you get it right, when you nail it, you go, I'm a driving God today. <laughs> and so it's uh, its one heck of a tough, challenging place. It's fast, flowing, fun. Anyways, anyways, uh, Tom, I sometimes feel the ABS kick in while braking hard. Does this defeat pushing the pedal any harder? Oh, wow, well, Tom, there's a... Uh, Tom, if you don't already, please go in and uh, go to my Substack. So if you go to rossbentley.substack.com, I wrote uh, a series of articles in like October, November, sort of in that time range in the fall. I wrote a series of articles about braking and uh, time and release of the brakes, trail braking, all sorts of things. And then um, a fellow who... Uh, works in the brake industry sent uh, me an, uh, an article about something where, cause I had suggested that braking at maximum isn't always the fastest way. And he sent me some information about where in his car with the ABS system in his car, if, and I try to remember the numbers off the top of my head, but please go and read that article. Um, 
if he braked with, let's say, let's say a thousand PSI, it's a lot of pressure, but let's say he pushed the pedal down with a thousand PSI, the ABS gave maximum braking to the front wheels. And so it gave like a thousand PSI to the front and about 800 or so to the rear, again, because of the brake bias. If he pushed harder and he pushed to 1200 PSI, the ABS dialed the whole system back to like 800 on the front and like 200 in the rear. So that ABS system would absolutely say, no, if you get to that point where you're just kind of feeling the ABS kicking in, kind of tickling the system, then don't push any harder. And, and so, um, and I've driven a lot of cars, the ABS recently in the last few years, where if you get to that point where it's just, you're just into the ABS and you push harder, you, you feel that the car isn't decelerating as much. So yes, for sure. There's a point where pushing harder isn't going to help. Uh, Arden asked, I saw an in-car video of Senna driving an NSX and he constantly feathered the throttle in the corners. Is this why he was so fast? And Peter Krauss said, I think he was just trying to get the NSX to turn. Um, I, I'm with Peter. That, that, that for sure, Senna had a, a technique where he was pretty, uh, what's the word, staccato? Uh, is that the right word worth kind of just like this with the throttle? He did that a lot in, in Formula One cars at, at times as well. I think like Peter, he's playing with it. I'm going to say somebody also uh, sent me a video a few years ago of Nico Rosberg driving a Porsche something or other at Silverstone. And he's got the car in these big drifts and everything. And he's like, wow, is that how it goes? Guys? Take a Formula One driver, put him in a production car, tell him we've got cameras running you're not going to get perfect, ultimate, fastest lap. You're going to get a little bit of showmanship and a little bit of play. Sometimes I think the sin was just out playing and kind of like, as Peter saying, just trying to get the thing to turn and play with it. Uh, so there is some of that. And then, you know, I, I, I've had the conversation with people, including some people that were part of Formula One teams uh, that Senna was in at the time. And, uh, you know, we sort of kind of went, you know, he did some things that were uh, technically not perfect, but he did them so well <laughs> that they worked. And, uh, you know, it makes you kind of wonder, like, if he did some other things differently, would he have been even better? It's kind of like, you know, the first time a tennis player came along and hit a backhand two-handed, people kind of went, well, that's just not right. Well, they made it work. And, you know, maybe ultimately with rackets and things like that, it made it actually better. But, um, yeah, so uh, just because Ayrton Senna did it doesn't mean that you should go and do it. Unless you just want to have some fun. And then go do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we, is that it? One more. One, okay, one last question, and then I'm going to call it off. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so if you're... Um, um, if you're about to type in a question, I'm going to, I'm going to call her quits here. Just, uh, I think it's time for everybody. Okay. Here it is. The last question. Da -da 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 -da. And it's from Victor. I have a C7 Corvette and always keep it in sport one mode because I like the idea of having some nanny help if the car kicks out or has some other issue. What am I giving up by not going into full track mode and will make a big difference in <laughs> uh, track mode? And will this make a big difference in my track time? Well, Victor, sort of the only way to know for sure is to try it. Um, but I think, you know, you also need to come back to what is your objective is, you know, how much are you getting paid <laughs> to turn a faster lap time? If it's like, man, Roger Penske is going to hire me if I knock two tenths of a second off my lap time, then you better go try that other mode. Uh, if it's like, you know what? I want to drive my car home at the end of the day. I'm willing to give up a couple of tenths. Then don't bother. Um, if it's, you know, I just want to learn what that would be like if I did that, then go and do that. But I, so what I can't do, I, what I cannot do, because I have not experienced your car, uh, 
myself is I can't tell you, would that make a difference by going to uh, from sport to track mode? Will that give you a tenth of a second or a whole second? I don't know. I, I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, and part of it would also depend on how well you're able to take advantage of that next mode, the track mode. Um, and that I don't know either. But um, so you, I, I think you have, well, you have two options, stay in sport or try track mode. And you, the, the decision you need to make about going to track mode is, what am I gonna get out of it? Am I just gonna learn something, which might be super valuable? Or am I just raising my risk level for no reason? Then that's that helps you with your decision. So great question. Hey everybody, thank you again. Uh, again, thanks for for being part of the Speed Seekers community. Um, as I said, I do have this uh, self coaching masterclass coming up on February twenty and twenty one. It's not a, I can oh I can come to the one on the twentieth or the twenty first. No, it's an and. It's a we're going to do one session and then the next session is going to build off the first session. So it's a two parter. Um, you can go to the website, go to resources, go to webinars and find a link to that page just about that. I am going to be sending out an email about it as well. And you'll probably see a bunch of notes from me from social media and emails about it as well. But uh, um, I, I'm really excited about taking what I did with a self coaching webinar that I did six years ago and really upping the content and everything involved in it and making it much better. And uh, I would love to be at the track with you every time you go to the track, but I can't do that. So I'm going to try to be there in spirit. How's that? Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for being on the, on the Chalk Talk. Uh, again, happy, uh, ha happy 2024. As always, keep learning, keep having fun. Thank you.